I want to tell you about one of the world's rarest, most secretive and under-celebrated drinks. It's made from fruit that grows on trees that can be 60 feet tall and age for 300 years. I'm talking about Perry. My name's Adam Wells. I'm the author of Perry, A Drinker's Guide, that's published by Camera Books. And in this series of videos, I'm going to give you an introduction to all things Perry. We're going to talk about the trees. We're going to talk about pears and the varieties of pears and the flavors we get from those varieties. We'll go through the making of Perry. And of course, we'll go through the different styles of Perry that you can buy to drink. And we're going to start right here in the three counties, right in Herefordshire, the heartland of British Perry, where it's been made for hundreds and hundreds of years from trees just like this in the Greg's Pit Perry Pear Orchard in Much Markham. James, um, thanks very much for having us. Tell us where we are. We're at Greg's Pit in Much Markle, and this is the orchard we call the Pit Orchard. And if you look behind us, you can see why. There is the Marl Pit that gives its name to the property, but also gives its name to a variety of pear. And um, we're right in front of one of Big Mama's progeny. This is um, a Greg's Pit pear that you can see has been grafted. We've got a nice graft mark here, about head height. So we think this tree's probably 250 years old, but you can see here, that's a really nice bit of new growth. That length, about five, six inches. So next February, or perhaps late January, I could snip that off with some secateurs or a pen knife, make a small shave to sh expose the cambium, and then with a rootstock, I could match cambium to cambium, put a little bit of insulation tape round, pop it in a pot, keep it not overwatered but moist and sheltered. And with a bit of luck, the graft will take and you'll see leaves coming off that material, the sky and wood, in the summer. So that's grafting. Grafting has been known about for centuries. Mm. There's a papyrus. If you look at Barry Juniper's book, which I'm sure you're familiar with, um, he talks about a papyrus scroll going back to, I think, 3500 BC. And th just imagine that eureka moment mm. when the ancients realized that they could clone a variety that they thought they liked to eat or that made a great fermenting, fermented drink. Mm. Um, they must have had that extraordinary moment all that time ago and realised, wow, we can do this. Because previously, they'd simply have been taking wildings and either eating or fermenting the product of the wildings mm. without being... Potluck. Totally potluck. It's amazing, isn't it, to think that every... Cabernet Sauvignon vine, every Dabinet apple, and yeah. you know every thorn pear has started with just yep. one tree, yep. and it's grafting that gives us orchards so, like this. So, and on that, on that note, we're going to meet the original wilding, and how do we know that? Well, we have DNA tested the wilding, which I call Big Mama, for reasons that we're about to see, and its progeny and they're genetically identical. identical. The other th distinguishing feature, apart from the absence of graft mark on the original wilding, is the sheer size, hence the nickname we give her, Big Mama. It's magnificent. Yeah, it's <laughs> enormous. I mean, how, how tall are we talking and well, how old it, are we talking? It's, it's, it's bigger than an oak tree, really. So we're talking, that's a, that's a, it's, this is, a, again, a, a sort of 250, 300 year old tree. Probably on the upper end of that, we think. It's something completely unique to Perry, isn't it? Yeah. To imagine that people have been drinking something made from this, not just this variety, but this tree's fruit for 
you know, nearly three centuries. Yeah. And actually, we're pretty close here to Helen's Manor, of course, we are. We are. where they have the Queen entries. Yep. So a, a whole, you know, treasure trove of these, these yep. ancient, ancient centuries old trees that have been harvested and had their fruit pressed for perry since before the french revolution yeah, before and, and, the american and war of independence been nurtured because they were valued and culturally significant in this landscape mm. so this connection between people place product mm. it's wonderful james has been looking after these trees and making perry for decades having an incredible impact on the local wildlife and environment in the process He's also been able to grow and care for these orchards to ensure their future, and he's diversified the varieties that are grown here by adding several more of his own. After sampling a few of the perries James has in tanks and bottle at the moment, whoa, that is just so good. We headed out to the Greg's Pit home orchard. This is a type example of the thorn perry pear. It's the earliest pear we harvest and it's the pair we use to make our method champenoise, which I think Adam features in the book. And we've got another nice big old Ailton red here. Mm. Um, a young Moorcroft there. Um, and in the bottom, we've got some old Blakeney reds. Here's one. Uh, I always like the, 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 the slight yeah, 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 yeah. lean on this one. These ones here, probably quite a lot younger, I think 150, 200. But again, the orchard is on the map mm. of 1785. And wow. um, so what we've been doing is planting into the gaps. And, and the, once they get their feet down, see that tree is only 20 years old. It they might really start going. Um, when did I plant this? Uh, I can read the variety. It says 1999. So, so this was planted in 1999. So it's a 25-year-old tree. Mm. Look at it. That's, a yeah, big that's, size. that's doing the business. Um, and what we're trying to do here is manage the orchard um, very much as an ecosystem. So you're seeing lots of dead wood. You're seeing hedges that have been laid in rotation, mm. not all at once. Um, you're seeing habitat stacks of cut material in the hedge line. All of this is about promoting biodiversity um, because if we've got healthy pollinators, we've got healthy birds. If we've got healthy birds, they're gonna remove the problem species as pests. Um, the system is in equilibrium. After a lesson in orchard management, James treated us to the perfect introduction to the next stop on our trip explaining just how beautiful Great Perry can be, how difficult it can be to get right, and how that all starts with understanding the characters and flavors of the many different varieties of Perry pears. Cider is easy. Any old dog can make cider that's drinkable. Perry, Tom calls her a fickle mistress. I just call her difficult because get it wrong, and you'll have something that'll be mousy and sour and cloudy with strange tannins and mustiness and all manner of mm. stuff going on. Uh, get it right and it's a thing of beauty that rivals the best white wine. We left James finding himself in my book and headed off to another world-class perry maker, Ross on Wye Cider and Perry in South Herefordshire. Now the Johnson family probably make more different single variety ciders and perries than any other producer in the world, so they're the perfect place to learn about the flavours and characters that individual perry pears have to offer. Albert Johnson, the fourth generation of makers on the farm, began our tour with a walk around his largest perry pear orchard, where he was quick to expand on James's assessment of just how challenging working with pears and making perry can be. So we're a family farm. We're growing all of our own apples and pears, um, or there's 50 acres or so of trees here. And we're actually stood right now in Dolly's Meadow Orchard, um, so named for our old historic cart horse that my great grandfather <laughs> had, and he planted in the orchard uh, sometime in the 40s. So these trees have all been planted by your family? Exactly. My dad put this orchard in 
um, in the 1980s. So by that point, we'd started to make a little bit of cider here and there. We'd planted orchards to supply fruit for apples to Bulmers. And my dad just started at that time to be interested in Perry as well. And this is actually a north facing slope. So, and very steep slope. So not so useful for apple crops certainly, and, and not so useful for, for apple trees. Um, and dad just reckoned, well, the only sensible thing to do is to put Perry pears here. Mm. And we're lucky now making Perry 40 years later uh, to still have some of the fantastic fruit that's in this orchard. That is, he's very much following the historic tradition there, isn't he? Of, uh, well, apples don't really make sense there, so what else can we plant? Yeah, exactly. We've got some massive, massive, incredible, beautiful trees here. Can you walk us through a few of them? Uh, I'll, I'll try, yeah. So as you glance at them, it takes a while to learn what they are. And actually, I've memorised what they are. Rather yeah, well, than... Especially with no fruit and on them at the moment. No fruit, exactly. So we've got a beautiful, really gorgeous, very bright leaves. This is a yellow huffcap tree, which is a really ast astounding pear. And actually, it's a pear that's very difficult to harvest because it, uh, it blets from the inside out. So it ripens mm. immediately in the beginning. And it does this over a period of, oh, 24 hours. So you can be looking at the pears and they look great. And the next year, they're all splattered on them. The next day, they're all splattered on the ground. Um, then we have here a row of Bartridge squash, which is the opposite problem. Bartridge squash, they're massive pears, brilliant to handpick. The problem is they fall off the tree and they're not ready to press for about another three weeks. Right. So you really have to know your varieties to be able to make a good pear. Finally, here though, we've got still a little bit of blossom on our red pear, or sometimes it's called Ailton Red after the village of Ailton where it was found. That's pretty much the perfect pear. It behaves, <laughs> you, when it falls off, it's nearly ready. There's no long storage um, and it reliably makes a really lovely nutty, creamy perry. So we're, we're really interested in growing a lot of different varieties mm. here. And because we have that privilege of growing them on the farm, we really get to know them as well as we can. And they're all handpicked at, at, as close to possible, the perfect moment. But mm. it's different every year and you have to learn every year. If I can just, again, point you to this magical, massive tree, in a really good year, we would be hoping that that single tree is enough to make a 220 litre barrel of perry wow. from just that one tree. Um, it's not always the case and it's not always a good year, but across all of our orchards uh, of pear trees, unfortunately because of um, recent tree losses, there's not so much, but we're, we're getting enough to make about half as much as we want. And then we actually spend a lot of time connecting with the growers around the area, um, paying them a proper rate so that they can go out and pick fruit from the, all, all the really precious but kind of abandoned pear orchards we've got around Herefordshire and Gloucestershire and bringing them here. So we're producing around 10 to 12 and a half thousand litres of pear a year. And to be honest, I wish that figure could double, but actually it's really hard to get the fruit. Yeah. We're limited by what we, we're growing. We're limited by what we can find and we're limited by just not knowing where the trees are and the fact that there's not that many of them. Mm. Uh, but perry is something that is on the up. There's real interest in it. There's a real appreciation for the fact that this is a, historic heritage drink produce in this area. Um, and so we're trying to get hold of it as much of it as we can. But in comparison, that's probably about 15 to 20% of our production or, or slightly less. So way more cider than Perry, but um, I, I hope it isn't always that. Albert's commitment to Perry was made clear as we watched him plant a selection of varieties never previously grafted on the farm. Part of Ross on Wise broader project of grafting as many different varieties as possible, creating a true library orchard of cider apples and peri pears. These young trees are especially exciting since they're some of the best pears used in the production of French peri, including Antricotin and Plante de Blanc, varieties rarely seen in orchards in the UK. Then, to really get to grips with just how different these pears can taste, we headed to Ross on Wise Cider's own pub, the Yew Tree Inn, to try a selection of single variety perries. So we've seen the trees being planted, we've learned a little bit about peri pear varieties, now it's about time we found out what they tasted like. So we've come to the Yew Tree Inn in Peterstow, which is probably home to the largest selection of single variety perries in the country, if not the world. So it's the perfect place to find out about peri pear flavours. Let's go inside and have a taste. Adam, welcome to the yew tree. Shall we drink some perry together? Shout out, this is probably the 
biggest number of Perrys ever in front of somebody at a pub. So tell me, tell me first of all what we've got in our glass. So this is a single variety Perry. Uh, it's from the Thorn pair, mm -hmm. uh, which as you well know is, is really a beautiful, excellent pair. Um, and for us, it's one of the most sessionable peri pairs as well. So it's a beautiful thing to keg condition. We serve this uh, with live, with a natural sparkle on draft uh, at the yew tree. Uh, it's such an aromatic peri. It becomes really jumping out at you, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Fawn is one of the earliest uh, pairs. We, we harvest it in the very beginning of September. And I think a lot of these early varieties tend to be the most aromatic. And, and Fawn, as you say, is really absolutely out there in, in exploding out of the glass mm. with, it, with its citrus, its lemon, lime, um, and, and everything else. And just straight away, it's got that lovely zingy, like beautifully clean freshness of elderflower and citrus and lime. And that's, you know, this is, this is the perfect, you know, not all Perry's for summertime, but, but this one will be perfect then. It's just, you know, packed full of like spring summer flavors. You can imagine sitting this out in the beautiful beer garden. Um, yeah, it, it's what, wonderful. What else would you want? Because fawn is an early variety, it actually has time to ferment in the warmer temperatures mm. of the early autumn, that it's then ready for the coming of spring. And so we tend to be able to release our new fawn um, at when the first sun is really shining in the sky. And it's perfect because it, it heralds that sunny, warm atmosphere, sharing the peri outside in the garden with everybody. How important are uh, varieties and talking about varieties to um, peri? For me, I think they're super important. We have a really limited number of uh, pear varieties we're growing in the UK, and each of them is super precious and has an amazing history behind it. Um, Thorn is one of the most widely grown varieties because it's so universally adored, but they're not all so abundant and some of them are, are particularly rare. The, the flaky bark that, that we have here next to us, there's only six mature trees of that pair growing anywhere in the world. So it's really uh, an amazing thing, just an amazing experience to even taste that when it, it's, it's, so, it's so unique. And what we have here is just a selection, not all, of the single variety perries that you make. So can you walk us through some of these? I'll try, I'll try and do my best, yeah, because as you say, there, there's a lot. <laughs> um, and we are always on the lookout for, for more. So uh, if I start by pointing out the beautiful speckled russet, um, that's actually a name that we gave to this pair because it's an, it's an unidentified pair. So it came to us, we, we bought the fruit from um, a pear grower uh, nearby. Um, and he didn't know what the pear was because the trees have the trees have been there longer than any, any landowners have been. So they, the name has been lost, and it looks like a speckly russeted pear, uh, but it has a totally unique flavour. It, it's all about delivering some lovely, bright, upfront kind of grapefruit flavour, and then very light in the middle, and then has really great bitterness. So quite unusual for a perry to have that full balance of flavour mm. all the way across. It, in comparison, Hendra Huffcap, old reliable a really beautiful, large, vigorous tree that, that makes an abundance of pears. Um, but that is not about the acid, not about the bitterness. It's, it's about fruit, it's about uh, marmalade, apricot characters, um, and, and just a real sense of juiciness running mm. through that pear. And then in, in comparison, something like Barland, um, you know, as you know, this is one of your favorite pairs to quote about because it's been grown for so long, treasured for so long. And the reason it's treasured is because it just has that balance. It, mm. it has um, real uh, delivery across the palate and really nice textured, textured finish with, with, um, with all sorts going on there where it, it's got that crisp lemon sherbet in the beginning but then it comes away and it has a real minerality to it, a real earthiness to it. I think talking about um, varieties, apart from the fact that some of them are really rare and you know there are all these varieties that are grown in the UK, it really helps people connect with the individual flavours and this huge broad spectrum of flavour that Perry has. Every single one of those pears, as you say, has a totally different flavour and character. And if people get to know those, then they can get to know Perry more broadly by finding out the flavours and styles that they enjoy most. Yeah, we, we totally agree. We think that by drinking individual single variety perries, you develop your palate, you enhance your understanding, and you're really able to connect with the flavours that all these unique pears are giving us. Mm. And then when you come back in a different environment and you're being presented with a blended perry, then your enjoyment of it goes so much deeper than it would do if you didn't have that background. Right, so Barland, we've seen the trees and we've talked quite a lot about this pear. But actually, um, even though it's the oldest specifically named variety that we're aware of 
um, in the UK, and despite the fact that it's still grown, it's relatively rare to see, I'd say, as a single variety. I think you, you obviously have made one here, and I know that we, I tried one from Bartistry, uh, but, but it's not really, really common, but just a wonderful thing to have a pair that dates back 400 years and we're still drinking it today. Yeah, it's, it's amazing that the variety has survived that long, because actually I think one of the reasons why it isn't so common as a variety is because actually the pears are quite scab prone, uh, which, which is a problem you can get with, with fruit, with apple and pears especially. Um, and so the trees aren't always that productive. Yeah. And I think that's kind of steered people away from it, but it's endured anyway. And I think because the quality of the drink it makes is really second to none. The, mm. The, you know, we were just saying the Hendra Huff Cap is maybe a bit too light, a bit too easy, that it's for enjoying, not, not for delving into. The flavour in this just goes and goes and mm. goes. It's got everything from the, the front palate to the back of the mouth to the lingering tannin that's coming after that. Well, let's try some. <laughs> it's amazing. It's, it's um, still got so much freshness and vibrancy. And there is some acidity in there. But it's also just got that lovely, bold, tannic structure. Now, the quote that, as you say, is a, is a favourite of mine um, about uh, the, the fruits being so astringent that even pigs won't eat them. But it's that tannin that gives this the body and the structure to just go and go. I mean, it's got a, such a long finish. And it really carries that fruit along. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm struggling to find the words to describe the flavour because I, I'm actually just enjoying it so much. Well, I think... <laughs> I think this and flaky bark would be another, and, and indeed but would be examples of when perry is actually really hard to describe in terms of just naming fruit flavors because mm. it evokes something else as well. It's got all of these sort of minerally qualities and yeah. that kind of taste that's almost like uh, when, when, it's, when it's rained and you get the petrichor coming off the rock. It's, mm. it's not just here are apricots or pears or, or whatever like that in the same way that maybe Winnell's Longdon might be. You know, it's got flavors that go in a totally different direction and really just speak of this variety and of the place that it's grown in. Yeah, I, I think you're so right. Um, it's of that variety. Mm. In, when we describe flavors in English, we're always saying that it tastes like something else. But actually, sometimes you just have to step back and realize that when you're tasting a single variety drink, it tastes of itself mm. and there's nothing else in the whole world that's quite like it. Yeah, especially peri pears like flaky bark and barland. Yeah, they've been <laughs> grown here since 1662. I mean, that's an amazing yeah, thing. Unbelievable. All the, all the orchardists that came before maybe sat in this very pub 100 years ago talking about barland then yeah. and, and trying it then, and we're carrying on that legacy. Yeah. Well, what a privilege. And thank you so much for sharing these with us. It's a pleasure. Cheers, Cheers Adam. So we learned about trees, we've learned about varieties. Those are our building blocks of peri flavor. But now we need to take the next step. We need to learn about how peri is made and about the styles of peri that augment those flavors of varieties even more. And to do that, we're gonna to have to head to North Herefordshire for a trip to Little Pomona. In the second part of our introduction to peri series, we'll visit a producer who has revolutionized cider and peri making in the UK bringing expertise from across the drinks industry, allied to the best of modern and innovative production methods. They're a maker who loves to play with varieties, methods, and even other fruits to make perry in all sorts of different ways. So there's nowhere better to learn about the different styles of perry. <laughs>